This is the Forbes Books Podcast, conversations with remarkable folks who are impacting the world of business and beyond. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla. My guest this week is Phil Geldart. As founder and CEO of Eagles Flight, Phil leads a globally renowned company focused on improving productivity and performance. Now, when it comes to leadership, Phil has the receipts. He spent nearly 20 years at Nestle Canada, where he served as SVP of HR and his extensive expertise in leadership development, acquisitions, sales, and driving profitability through strategic use of human capital. Phil, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm great, Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Summer is over in Canada, so that's not so good. I didn't even know there was summer in Canada. Is that a thing? <laughs> three months. That's it. Comes and goes. Oh, three months. Uh, you know, the reason I want to have you on the podcast is I just saw something that you wrote on Forbes about the flavor of the month. A culture transformation cannot be the flavor of the month. And I know this is part of your bag, like helping companies transform yep. from within. Um, without giving away too much of the story so people can look it up and I'll link it in the show notes. What do you mean by that? Transformation being the flavor of the month. Well, I can tell you what I don't mean. I don't mean you get a chance to pick your favorite ice cream, which <laughs> I wish it were. I, I think, you know, very often, Joe, organizations are highly committed to getting the right culture. They maybe feel like, well, it's not exactly where we want it to be. It needs to be better. And so they take action. They don't really take action that's going to produce a result, but it looks glitzy. They've got posters, they've got communication. They talk about it at town halls, but after two or three months, nothing has really happened. So the organization goes, okay, well, this month we talked about culture for a few months. Uh, a couple months ago, we talked about safety. A few months ago before that, you know, we talked about, you know, the importance of every person. It's just flavor of the month. It, there's no seriousness to it. As opposed, for example, to where you might say to me, Phil, I am really serious about an organizational commitment to every employee being safe every day. Like, okay, I mean, how serious are you, Joe? Say, no, no, like, like, I'm serious. Are you serious enough to stick with it until you actually get the results you want? And that's the critical question. Are you willing to stick with it until you get the results? And the moment you say yes, it moves it from flavor of the month to a corporate priority. And that's really what we're after. Is it a corporate priority or is it just something you aspire to, but you're not really willing to put the time and energy behind to ensure it produces the results you want? I love that. And it's funny because I, I call, I don't know if anyone else has called this, but I call what corporate America has and, and in North America has is project management syndrome. They want to create boxes to check. And I feel because of culture has taken such gravity over the last few years, that culture has just become another box to check. Are you seeing that as well? Because I feel like that sometimes sucks sort of the, the spirit of a lot of companies and a lot of organizations because it's like, okay, I don't know if I did that job well or did it really well or did it crappy, but I know I checked the box. Yeah, that's a good question, Joe. I think a few years ago, it was that. I, I think culture was a thing a few years ago. We need a culture. We need a vision. We need a mission. Today, I don't think it's that. I think today, organizations have come to realize that their culture is really important that the way people feel about the company, the way they act in the company, the way they speak about the company when they're not there. And in fact, you know, someone was just asking me recently what I thought about whether or not it was a good thing to have surveillance software on people's computers. And I said, well, that's a big topic. But essentially, if the, if the individual is highly committed to the vision of the company, highly committed to the outcomes, to the customer service, they're paying attention to that. That's what they're spending their energy about. So why would you ever want to survey them or, or put surveillance on them? It, it's just counterproductive in my mind. And I think that that in a way is reflecting what is going on in today's world, that people really want to contribute, but organizational cultures are not allowing it. And therefore, there's this frustration that I would like to contribute more. I would like to make a bigger difference. I think organizations are saying, yeah, well, we would like you to. We really would, but they don't know how. And so you end up with poor cultures. You end up with turnover. You end up with questions like, well, maybe we should put surveillance on them. You're, you're trying to impose behavior as opposed to, in my judgment, building a conviction where people want to bring your culture to life. 
And that conviction translates into action, and that's what really gives you the culture. So I think today it's less about check the box, get the culture right, and more about, no, we really want the right culture, but how in the world do we do it? Do you think that leaders sometimes don't even know what their own culture is? And the reason I bring this up is I spoke to a CEO at the height of the pandemic after everybody went 100% remote, and the CEO said to me, man, I am so surprised how seamlessly we went into remote work. I didn't, I'm surprised that we're still so efficient. And I almost felt like, I didn't say this, but I probably should have. I said to the CEO, so like, so you hired all these people. They've been part of your team. You pay their salaries, but you didn't trust them to work from home. And so I always feel like sometimes leaders don't know what their culture is. Like they may have all like the fancy signs and, and the dynamic words written all over the office, but they sometimes don't even know what their own culture is. I think they know what their culture is producing. So again, you've got to think, if you think about an organization, an organization produces a product or service, and there are peripheral things that impact that, like how do my customers feel? How do my suppliers feel? What is my supply chain like? But fundamentally, the organization exists to produce a product or service. To get that, People have to do things. So if you take everybody out of a company, it goes out of business. <laughs> it's just like, so you need people. So the, the CEO, the executives, the senior leaders, they know what the company is producing and they know how that product or service is being received. We're having more errors than we want or the quality is good, but it's not consistent or the customer is not happy for some reason. So they're seeing a byproduct of the work that they are doing. And then they're introspecting saying, well, what do we do about that? And that question typically leads to, well, we need different tools. We need different software, or we need a bigger building, or we need a larger workforce or a smaller workforce, but their solutions gravitate towards the things which you can easily control. And they tend not to be able to say, yeah, but why don't we just change what people do? So, and the answer is because, well, I don't know how to change what people do. I, I can give them tools. I can give them equipment. I give them software and give them more trucks and I can hire more drivers. But how do I change what people do? But if you actually go back to first principles, the results we're getting is as a result of what people are doing with the trucks, the software, the equipment, the whatever it is. So if they are unhappy with the results, it's not always the case, but in, in many cases, the place they should look is, okay, what are the people doing? And we wish they did something different. And the, the challenge, the magic is what would that difference look like? So if you're really trying to change a culture, you should begin by saying, not what is our culture? What do I like about our culture? What do I not like about our culture? But if we had a shift of some sort, whether seismic or minuscule in our culture, how would people behave differently? How would leaders behave differently? And if they behave differently, how would it impact the results that we are getting financially, environmentally, quality-wise, and so on? That is a very difficult question to ask and a very difficult question to answer because they don't really know what to do with the answer often because they're experts at making bicycles. They're not experts at changing how people actually behave. So they impose things on them and they try different things, but they're not really have a disciplined approach to how do we actually change people to behave. So I think it's a much more complicated thing because culture is so powerful and so pervasive. Joe, it's unbelievable, right? How you perform is relate is like, how do you feel in your job? How do you feel about your boss? How do you feel about your coworkers? How do you feel about the company's goals and aspirations? But all those things have feelings in them. There's nothing to do with, okay, how many hours per day are you working? Am I making sense? Yeah, no. And I want to, I don't know if this is semantics or not, but you used to, you said the word a couple of times, change culture. Yep. Can you change a culture or is it more about 
improving a culture. And I apologize to the semantics, but this is like what I hear, like, you know, the old phrase, like you can't change a person, but you can become a better person. So is it the same thing changing and improving no, no. or is it two different things? They're very different. And okay. yes, you can change a culture for sure. It begins by saying typically a company's culture doesn't need to change. I mean, once in a long time. It's usually an aspect of the culture that needs to change. So we're quite happy with our the degree to which we respect and value individuals, but our culture in the world of sales is too much around farming and not enough around hunting. So we would like to change that aspect of our culture. Or we're just not collaborative enough. We Our culture is far too siloed. The quality is good. The commitment to safety is good. But we need to change this aspect. So again, we need to be careful because we talk about culture transformation. It sounds like, well, oh, the whole company needs to change its culture. But rarely that's the case. It's more this aspect of the culture is not giving us the optimal results. What do we do about that? And then you target that. And that you can absolutely change because the culture is what people do. So if I change what they do, I change the culture. It's not difficult. It's it's requires perseverance. Yeah. You've got to hold you gotta hold the course back to how you began. If you think it's simple and you think of it, I'll do this relatively quickly, it becomes flavor of the month and fails. If you are willing to stay the course to get that outcome, then for sure we can change the culture. And I want to get into the work you're doing at Eagles Flight and how you're helping teams change their culture. But I want to step back a little bit because I know culture has been a big part of your life. You spent nearly 20 years at, at Nestle. And I want to know what it was like to work in people and HR before there were 10,000 books written about culture. Because now if you go into a, a bookstore, you could literally drown in books written about culture and and how te teams can change culture and inspirational words. And But you were doing it before all these books were readily available. What was that scene like? Like how did people change culture or improve their culture before an Eagle's flight came along or before there were a hundred million TED talks and podcasts about culture. I chuckle because I wrote one of those books myself. <laughs> <laughs> Perceptive question, Joe. Let me come back to something I said a little earlier. The organization has an obligation to their shareholders to produce results. And that is that has been the case you know, forever. So 20 years ago or 25 years ago, before people ever even thought about culture, they thought about mission and vision, but they didn't even think about culture. They were still thinking about results. And as the world becomes more and more sophisticated, you think, well, what are the levers that I can pull to improve my results? Well, I can do marketing. Keep okay, in today's world, I mean, marketing, yes, you can get a creative market, but everybody's got access to marketing. Okay, well, I could have better technology, but everybody's got access to better technology. I could build a bigger or better factory, okay. But it's very hard to get a competitive advantage if you're in an industry where it, it's not being driven by innovation or a new product. You're just, so how do I improve my results when the tools that I have are available to all my competitors? And the answer, at least certainly at the earlier in my career, was... The answer lies in harnessing the potential of the workforce. It's a fascinating thing. If you go to most organizations now, far more than than today, and say to the employees, could you contribute more if you were led differently? If this context that you worked in, the environment you worked in were different, could you contribute more? And they go, yeah, absolutely. And 25 years ago, organizations were far more hierarchically driven than they are today. They're far more authoritative, there were more layers, there were more rules. You clocked in and you clocked out. So these people were saying, yeah, if, if the leader was better, if people listened to my ideas, if the environment was more conducive to me contributing, sure I could add. So if you then say, okay, how can I make it so that the potential of the individual worker is felt? So if you think, Joel, I'm sure you've worked for many people in your career. Some of them you've worked for, you've been able to be more productive than others. So you go, well, why is that? You're the same guy. It's because the person you were working for had greater respect for your potential and they allowed you to fulfill it. 
So if you could get at the potential of the workforce, you then improve the results, which gives you a competitive advantage. And as that reality became more and more apparent, people labeled it culture. And so the migration, okay, let's focus on culture. But really, way back when it began, no, let's just focus on human potential. And even today, when people talk to me about, okay, Phil, help me talk about my culture. I say, okay, good, yes. Let's begin by talking about the potential in your workforce because that's where the value is. I love that. And it's funny, you were asking about like how I uh, form depending on different leaders. And I think that's the tricky part for leaders is like, what is that secret sauce for that person? For me, when a leader gives me full autonomy, I'm I'm a rock star. Like you, no one could do a better job than I can if you give me full autonomy. But finding that thing, like for me, I'm a type A, so I think it's easier for leaders to say like, okay, this is his thing. How do you find that thing that gets the best out of your team on an individual basis? And I know, and I can't imagine when you're extrapolating out to ten thousand employees or a thousand employees. That's hard to find out what that thing that makes each of them special. I'm hesitating because I think there are two answers. Much like you, somebody once asked me, so Phil, what is it that really drives you? And I said, challenge. He's it it <laughs> a smart leader, so all he did was challenge me. I think in hindsight, I maybe should have said, well, money. But, <laughs> but the, the, for the rest of my career, he made sure that I was always challenged. So it's to your point. You know, In your case, it's like autonomy. So I do believe, yes, there are things which individuals feel are more motivating than others. But that's not hard to find out. You just ask them. <laughs> I mean, you just say, hey, what? Now, if there's no trust between you and your leader, that's pointless. So it, to get to that point, you have to build trust, which is a different topic. But if I trust my leader and they ask me that, I'll tell them. So I think the simple answer is it doesn't have to be a mystery. You just have to have an honest conversation. However, the second answer is almost without exception, people come to work and they want to do a great job. Very rarely does somebody go, leave the door, say to their partner, hey, listen, I'm going to go to a terrible job today. It's going to be another horrible, I'm just going to do everything I can to be really lousy today. I'm going to be horrendously bad yet again today. The most people leave saying, I want to do well. I, I want it now. They may want to get promoted, but they may just want the sense of self-satisfaction of a job well done. They may want to please their leader, or, but most people really want to do well. So the question is, how can you set them up so that they can always do their best work? And if you can do that, you get to the issue of how do you get people to fulfill their potential? And I think, so again, if we go in and do culture transformation, we train on that. That's why I say, can it be trained? Sure. But I have to train the leader in the first example to build trust. And then I have to train the leader to say, how do you lead in such a way that the person actually can do their best work? And one of the areas is, okay, help me understand the, the guidelines, the boundaries, what we call the sandbox. So I want to play within my full sandbox. But I don't want the sandbox to be too big because I don't have enough experience. So, I mean, that'll just frustrate me. And I don't want it to be too small because I'll feel constrained. So now the leader says, okay, well, man, if I could get the right size sandbox for Joe, he can perform to his optimum. So then we teach them, okay, so how do you do that? And then how do you grow Joe's sandbox so he can do more and more? Because he wants to do more. But he wants to do more in an environment where he can contribute and know that he's adding to val adding value. So it sounds like, boy, there's a lot you got to do, but it can all be codified and it can all be taught. Leaders do certain things. Okay, don't do those things. Do these things. Don't think about people as things. Think about them as live human beings with great potential and families. And, oh, okay. Well, how do I do that? You, you know, it's interesting, Joe. I, the, as we grow through our careers... We get promoted on the basis of our technical competence. So if you start out and you're working on a you know, working on a road crew and you're the best road crew worker, they make you the road crew foreman, but you're still managing backhoes and shovels and stuff. And then they promote you. So now you're the manager. You get to hire a couple of folks, but you're still working on the road crew. But 
as you get promoted, you more and more deal with people. But your promotion and your growth, your career has been on your skill with the tactics of doing stuff, building roads, operating backhoes. And all of a sudden, you suddenly wake up and go, wait a minute, there's a whole lot more of my time spent on people. Well, I guess I'll just apply the same principles to people I applied to managing backhoes. And it doesn't work, which is why as you grow through your career, if you're not properly trained, you just without, it's no maliciousness, but you tend to treat people as things because that's how we grew up in our careers, managing things until all of a sudden we had more people than things and say, well, I guess it works the same way and people are resilient and they respond. But the moment you do that, you stop thinking about their potential. You start thinking of them as a thing, do this, do that, get this outcome. And I don't even think about the fact you could do far more. How am I going to get that out of you? So it's a totally different set of skills to release human potential than to operate in a technical environment, which is where most of us grew up. Yeah. And it reminds me too that, you know, we like to say that we don't give people enough credit, but I think sometimes we give them too much credit. Uh, uh, someone told me a story where they had this employee who was with the company for years and they they went up to them and said, hey, we're going to make you a manager. You're going to run this division. And the person's like, great. How do I do that? Because I only know my job. How do I know? Yeah. How, yeah. how do I become a man? And there is no school for that. Like once you're in a company, they're, they're not going to, hey, so we want to make you a manager. So please go to this school and, and take this class for three months and then come back. They, people don't do that. So how do we bridge that divide of when these people become elevated within an organization and their leadership skills need to get honed and sharpened and you know, and all the metaphors you want to throw in there. But how do we do that within a company? Yeah. And organizations once asked us to come and train their managers. And uh, I took a great gamble because I said, okay, it was a five days training program over time. And in the first day, I taught, I said, okay, I'm going to teach them to value human potential. And they looked at me like, what? You're going to do what? So I'm going to teach them to value human potential. You're going to take a, a day. We're paying you to teach them to, teach them to communicate and set goals and give them feedback, wow. manage conflict. And you're going to, I said, yep. I said, okay, you better be right. So we walked in on the first day and I said, ladies and gentlemen, let me just explain to you. You're here for leadership training. You control the lives of people and those people have families or relatives or friends and they have people reporting to them and everything you do is going to impact their lives. And those people are just like you. They aspire, they want to do well, they want to be valued, they, they want to be heard and you are responsible for all of that. If you understand that and if you understand the impact that you can make on their lives and therefore the impact that they will have on the customers and the quality and the safety, you will be an unbelievable leader. And they went, wow, we never thought about it like that. So, okay. So over the next little while, I'm going to teach you how to do that. But it begins with understanding that it's not about learning the skills. It's about being able to implement the skills that I teach you to release the potential of people who put their lives in your hands at work. And it was transformative because we set them up to realize that leadership isn't about telling people what to do. It's about enabling people to contribute to their fullest within the confines of the values and the cultures of the company. And once they got that mindset, they go, well, that's okay. That's great. I want to learn to do that. So the, <laughs> the skills, it was like we were tilling the soil. When we put the seed in, it produced fruit because they understood that it wasn't about learning to be a good communicator. It was about communicating in a way that the other person felt valued because they were of value and that the person felt heard because they had things to say. And they, okay, I begin to understand that. So I, I think it, when you ask me how, it begins with that. And once you get that, that's unbelievable because then you've got the hearts and the minds and the wills of all these people out there. And especially in today's world where you've got a new crop of people coming into the workforce who are highly motivated and really smart to release that potential. And it just all goes to the bottom line because it produces a better result. 
And did that organization ask for their money back after that one day? Uh, <laughs> d- d- it no, worked they, out for them? No, yeah, oh, yes. It worked out well. Yeah, That's that's awesome. Uh, so let's r- uh, wrap things up talking about Eagles Flight. And I know th- there's a lot that goes to it uh, with Eagles Flight, but one of the things I want to key in is behavior change. Um, and behavior change is some one of those things where you don't really hear talked about in the corporate level. It's like behavior change is like when you talk about dogs and children. Yep. But behavior change in fully formed adults who are paid well or, or compensated pretty well uh, to change their behavior. Can you break that down a little bit for me as we wrap things up here? Sure. So if I change the behavior, I change the result. Okay. So that makes changing behavior worthwhile, whether it's how I treat someone who's renting a car from me or how I'm leading somebody who's about to go off and make an acquisition. So change the behavior, change the result. So how do I change the behavior? You need four things, Joe. You always need four things. You first have to build a conviction in the person to want to change. They don't want to change, they won't change. And the magic of Eagle's Flight is we have experiential learning tools that let us do that. So I don't lecture you. I put you in an environment and you conclude for yourself, hey, I should change. I could be better. So conviction is key. The second thing is, okay, I want to change. I don't know what to do. So you got to tell me, and you got to tell me in a way that I don't have to refer to a binder or a book or a flip chart. Okay. It's got to be in my head. So that's knowledge. The third thing is, okay, I got it, but I'm not sure I know how to put it into practice on the job. So now you have to give me opportunities to practice it on the, on the job or in the class or so that I get it. And the fourth, which is often missing is you need to hold me accountable for the improved results that will come from the application of the behavior change. So the organization isn't equipping me with these new skills out of the goodness of their heart. They expect a result. So don't ask me as the trainer to guarantee the result. What I'm going to ask you as the person learning the new skills to demonstrate them and produce the result. So the person goes into the classes, okay, I build conviction. I learn what to do. I know how to do it. And I'm I'm held accountable to actually produce incremental results. Well, okay, no problem. As long as you have all four things in place, you're good. And the way we remember that is conviction is heart, knowledge is head, practice is hands, results is harvest. So you change behavior with heart, head, hands, and harvest. Sounds easy. (laughs) <laughs> feel free to hire us <laughs> his name is phil geldar he's founder and ceo of eagles flight phil thanks so much for the time really appreciate it my pleasure and that'll do it for another episode of the forbes books podcast don't forget to hit subscribe that way you'll get new episodes as soon as they're available and if you have a spare moment i would greatly appreciate it if you could leave a review which would help other exceptional folks like you discover the show you can always connect with me on x linkedin and instagram at joe partavilla and please Don't forget the golden rule and treat others as you want to be treated. Thanks for listening. Until next time, adios.